some of you might be thinking, dang, she looks old to be in high school. Actually, I just graduated, you know, 14 years ago. In high school, I wasn't the party girl. I was the goody-goody two-shoes, rule follower, devoted Christian. I was a cheerleader, voted most friendly. I was the girl that the rebellious kids hated and the jocks liked. So naturally, I married a jock. My husband, Andrew, played college football while he was in seminary studying to be a pastor. We married, had a daughter, and went on to have what appeared to be a perfect life. In the confines of my seemingly perfect life, I believed the lie that life was fair. If you were kind to others and did the right thing, that you would be rewarded with a great life. I didn't realize that bad things happen, even when you spend your spring break going on mission trips. My life's journey has led me to discover that life is in fact not fair. Bad things happen to good people. When my bad thing happened, I found myself with a fatal lack of courage and no way to cheerlead my way out of it. Many of you have had things happen to you that are unfair. You get grounded for something you didn't do. You dieted for two weeks and still can't fit into your skinny jeans. Right, guys? Or worse, your family splits apart or you lose somebody that you love. See, that's what happened to me. My husband, Andrew, fell in love, put a ring on it. We had a beautiful daughter and we were leading a pretty great life. But they say in marriage that two people join together to become one. We fought over which one? See, we started fighting over little things. He'd roll his eyes at my super peppy, the glass is always half full positivity. I called him critical. Yes, he was my Mr. Right, my Mr. Always freaking Right. I remember there was one time I made him so mad, I don't know what I did, but he locked me out of our house. So I had to go hang out at my parents' house for a couple of hours until finally my dad must have got sick of me being there because he whips out his cell phone and he texts Andrew, no take back, son. He obligingly came and got me. We fought over little things to the point we ended up sleeping in different rooms. But then one day, everything changed. The call came about his medical test results, cancer. At 29 years old, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. See, there's stage one, where there's a pretty good chance of remission or temporary or full recovery. And then there's stage four, which is the most advanced stage, and it can mean that cancer spread to other parts of the body. Andrew realized that his days might be numbered. I fell apart. When I heard the news, I thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening to me, to my husband, to our family. I looked across the room to see my two-year-old daughter, Ellie, playing with her toys on the floor. And I ran over there and I just scooped her up in my arms and I held her close. And I couldn't talk, I burst into tears. I thought, I can't do this. My husband calmly walked behind me and he wrapped his arms around me and he held us as I cried, drenching his shirt with tears. He said, Bailey, Bailey, honey, it's gonna be okay. I'm not afraid. If I'm gonna die, I'm not afraid. And I looked at him. And in that moment, I realized the man that I married. And suddenly all that small, stupid stuff slid away. And now the fact that he forgot to put the toilet seat down didn't matter. Or that he ate chips and salsa in bed and got crumbs everywhere didn't matter. Because in that moment, I felt my husband's unrelenting courage. Here he was given the worst news, and he's comforting me. Why can't we appreciate what we have when we have it? Or why do we only appreciate what we have when it's gonna be taken from us? The next 10 months were a whirlwind of chemotherapy, radiation, and hospital visits. But as we grew closer, I got stronger. And now I was the one who held him on those desperate nights where he cried wondering, would our daughter remember her dad? He'd say, Bailey, I'm so worried I'm not gonna be there to walk her down the aisle. Will she resent me for leaving her? I just want her to know how much I love her. And that's when he got an idea that changed all of our lives. He asked me, he said, Bailey, will you go buy me some colored pencils? I wanna start drawing with Ellie. Almost every night, Ellie would crawl up next to her dad in the hospital bed that we had in our living room, where they would draw pictures together of Ellie's favorite animals. She would giggle as he showed her the different pictures that he drew for her. And then one day he said, Bailey, I wanna make her an alphabet book with pictures of her favorite animals. And I wanna write her love letters with all the important life lessons that I want her to know. I said, I love it, go for it. And then he'd get to the letter C and he'd have a lesson. And Ellie would wanna do more, but then he had brain surgery. We didn't think he'd go the full alphabet. But despite brain surgery and despite being weakened after another round of chemo, he said, get me the book. I've gotta get through the alphabet. 
My favorite letter of the alphabet that Andrew wrote and illustrated for our daughter is the letter C. Can I show you? This is the reason why I'm standing in front of you all today rather than depressed and in bed. C is for courage, cat. Courage doesn't come because you are big, strong, or without fear. Courage comes because you aren't big, you aren't strong, you do fear, but you don't give up. My husband didn't give up on this gift for our daughter. In fact, when the pain wasn't so great, he worked on this book. He lived to get to the letter Z for zebra, which says to change your stripes, who you are. You must realize that nothing is set. You can always grow. This book was his love letter to our daughter. A to Z, he finished the book that we called The Ellie Project. But C is for courage, and that's the gift that my husband gave to me that I'm passing on to you today. See, Andrew was fearless and a natural speaker. I am not. I remember he was scheduled to speak at my high school alma mater and the Christian school that we both taught and coached at after graduating from college. The entire school and their families raised money for our family, and they dedicated a day to honor us. On the drive there, Andrew got sick and had to go to the hospital. He looks at me and he says, Bailey, please go speak. They're depending on us. Just the idea of standing in front of a bunch of people freaked me out. I was so scared, I couldn't do it. I hung my head, I couldn't look him in the eye. I said, I can't do it. You're the one with all the confidence. They wanna hear you, not me. After all, it's your story. And he didn't say anything. He just looked at me. But there was disappointment in his eyes and he canceled. Andrew got sicker, but he wrote another book about having faith through the gray and uncertain parts of life. And his book was published, A Gray Faith. Abnormally frail and thin for his frame, he may have been emaciated and ill, but with a smile on his face, he spent hours signing each copy of his book. This is what courage looks like. Seeing him do that, I saw someone who had every reason to be depressed who knew he was going to die, but so joyful about giving something to the world to make it a better place. I saw his courage in spite of his weakness. I saw a dying man full of life. Andrew died a month after a gray faith was released. I went into shock and denial, and yet I felt his eyes on me. I felt his strength tell me to not give up, and I opened up the manuscript of the Ellie Project to the letter C, courage. And I realized that I don't have to wait for courage to speak out, that I could show up in spite of my own gray faith. It was my doubts about myself that were keeping me small and trapped in self-pity. And that's when I realized I could be a single mom. I could share Andrew's message, that if I waited for my insecurities to leave me, I might be waiting my entire life. Courage doesn't come because you are big, strong, or without fear. Courage comes because you aren't big, you aren't strong, you do fear, but you don't give up. And that's when I made a decision that scared me, that I would speak Andrew's message. My first talk, I was terrified. I was speaking in front of a group of 35 realtors, but to me it felt like I was speaking to a million. It was just a meeting room, no mic or stage. They introduced me, they applaud, I froze. My legs wouldn't carry me to the center of the room. I thought, why the heck did I say yes to this? Everybody's looking at me and I can't move. And I looked at their faces and I remembered the look of disappointment in Andrew's eyes on the day that I told him I wouldn't go speak for him. And then I remembered something else. I remembered how committed Andrew was to get up and go speak at a different church almost every weekend after he could barely get out of bed from being so weak and sick from his chemotherapy and radiation treatments. Courage doesn't come because you are big, strong, or without fear. Courage comes because you aren't big, you aren't strong, you do fear, but you don't give up. My legs moved me, I opened my mouth and I spoke. And every time I get up to speak, like right now, I'm scared. But every time I take that risk, I get a little more courageous and a little more confident. And that's why I'm here today, to tell you, and I never thought I'd say this, but sometimes life's challenges, those unfair things that happen to us, are gifts that make us stronger. So I wanna ask you, what haven't you done because you're afraid? What are you waiting for to take a risk in your life? The moment to have courage is now. Because courage happens when we take that step, whether it's to the center of a small room 
or picking up that phone and telling somebody just how much you love and appreciate them. Whatever that is for you, today is that day. You know, life doesn't show up good or bad. It just shows up. We all have bad things that happen to us, but we can control how we react to them. We can blame others. We can say, my parents split, so I messed up. Or my teacher hated me, so I got a bad grade. We can't control the things that happen to us. We can only control how we react to them. You have a choice. Are you gonna blame someone for all the small ways they let you down? Are you gonna love them now? Right now, I want you to think about somebody who's important in your life. Maybe it's a parent, a family member. Maybe it's somebody that you're really angry at. What would happen if they were suddenly gone? Would they know how much you love them? And would you have regrets at not telling them how much you truly do care? Change happens from what you do next. Right now, that small book that my husband wrote and illustrated for our daughter is being read to children worldwide. That's the power of love. So what's next is up to you. It's as easy as picking up the phone, calling, texting, emailing, simple words in one word, love. Andrew Bryant Hurd took his final breath surrounded by his family in the home that he grew up in on July 26, 2013. His final words on that day were to me. He said, Bailey, I love you. I feel Andrew's presence everywhere, and I have to give gratitude. Andrew, thank you for creating more gratitude in my life, more depth in my soul, and for showing me the true meaning of life. Thank you for helping me to see the world through a more fulfilling lens, a lens that gives to the world, that focuses on love, and that has faith and courage in spite of fear. Thank you, Andrew.